Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Tom Zook's U.S. Civil War Diary, 1862, Part 2. October 25th, 1862. This morning we are distributed around town on provost duty. Eighteen men with a lieutenant and corp- corporal are on the railroad bridge. About eighteen at the depot and the remaining non-commissioned officers and privates are stationed at the Reb Hospital. I am at the latter place. There is about 43 sick, 43 sick rebels here. They were left by the Sesesh when they left in such a hurry for Dixieland. Now he's, ta- he's in Kentucky now. They also left one surgeon and two or three nurses. I have had conversation with some of them and they seem to be very sick of the war. And all they ask is to be allowed to go home. Here we are very comfortably quartered and have every facility to write and make our own use of the time while here. It has begun to snow a little today and the weather is changing rapidly to a winterish style, but I guess it will not last long. October 26, 1862 Last night after fixing ourselves for a comfortable night's rest, an order came to us from the captain ordering me and another corporal to report at the provost marshal's headquarters as soon as possible. The marshal has established himself in the courthouse of this county and very good quarters it makes for us poor soldiers who have so long put up with nothing better than a thin canvas house for a shelter. On reporting at the courthouse, we found that we were to be placed on guard duty. As there is confined in this building 77 sesesh, that means... uh, Confederates, prisoners of war, and of all the scaly, dirty, greasy, ragamuffin set of butternuts that any mortal ever seen, I think these take the lead. They claim to be deserters from all parts of the rebel army in Kentucky, but our provost marshal don't believe any such gammon and treats them as prisoners of war. They expect to be paroled, but in that particular they will be most woefully disappointed, for they will every one of them be sent to Camp Chase. This morning there is about five inches of snow on the ground and things outdoors begin to look kind of winterish. The Sesesh prisoners from the courthouse and those at the hospitals were all put on board the cars this morning and shipped to Camp Chase for greater security. We have, quite, we have had quite a lot of disorderly and drunken soldiers and citizens brought before the marshal today. Some of them have been placed in confinement until further orders from the general. October 27. There has not been many brought before the marshal today. Those that have been brought up are principally soldiers straggling off from their regiments. October 28. Last night the order came for us to repair to camp by 9 o'clock and be ready by 7 o'clock to move in the direction of Lexington. At the appointed time we were off for the new point of encampment, which we reached by 5 o'clock. Having traveled over 18 miles of road and encamping about 4 miles north of Lexington. This is the finest country that I ever saw, and the remark generally was by those who have seen something of the USA, that this is the finest country they ever saw. October 29, 1862. Today the soldiers are allowed to rest and take things easy. There is a great many soldiers in this vicinity. Camps can be seen in every direction as far as the eye can see. There was three brigades came in with us, making in all about 15,000 men. We are preparing today for the general inspection and mustering day which comes on the 31st, the last day of the month. The prospect is now that we will soon get our pay, October 30th. We have been ordered to get ready to march again by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, so our payday will be put off for a while at least. October 31. This morning we are once more on the move after marching four miles. We, play, we pass the monument erected to the memory of the Sage of Ashland. It is just on the outskirts of Lexington on the side at which we entered from the north. It is a beautiful piece of architecture built of white marble and reaches to the height of 132 feet. The base, which is a splendid piece of workmanship, composes about one-third of the whole height and is mounted by a column of beautiful proportion, the order of which I could not determine from the distance I had to view it from, 
The cap of the column is also a splendid piece of work. The whole is, sur the whole is surmounted by a splendid statue of the sage and statesman. Such respect may Kentucky well pay to her noble son, Henry Clay, one of the brightest stars of the age in which he lived. Opposite the monument of Clay and on the other side of the pike is the State Lunatic Asylum. It is, judging from an outside view, a very con conveniently arranged and substantially built institution. Lexington is the most beautiful town that I ever passed through. It is a place of considerable size and well laid out and has some splendid buildings in it, but it is a place of considerable age also. I noticed one church that was erected as long ago as 1806, re-erected in 1859. Just south of town we passed the once famous farm of Henry Clay, but it is now considerably dilapidated, especially the fences. It now belongs to the recreant son of the Patriot statesman, and is, is in the possession of his wife, she, he being in the... Re he being in the rebel army. After leaving Lexington, we marched 12 miles to a little town by the name of Nicholsville, where we encamped for, for the present, marching in all about 16 miles. This march was a very easy one for the 96th Ohio, as we were in the advance and never went over two miles an hour. November 1. Today we have done nothing but lounge around in our tents. The boys are too tired to drill or to fix up their quarters. I have found by inquiry that this town is about 8 miles from the Kentucky River and 14 miles from Camp Dick Robeson. It is also the terminus of the Kentucky Central Railroad. The order is now from the general commanding that the men shall fix up their quarters as comfortable as possible, for we will in all probability stay here for the next 60 days, if not all winter. We have a very good campground. It is just north of the town and in a beautiful wood, that will in a great measure screen us from the rough blasts of winter. The great drawback here, like in all of our, our other camps since we began marching, is the want of water. We have but a small quantity and poor at that. November 2. Sunday again, but to us Sunday usually brings more labor than any other day in the week. This forenoon I have had to attend to the drawing of the rations of the whole company, and after I had them drawn, it took from noon till two o'clock to divide them among the messes, five days' rations being drawn. So I got no chance to attend church or anything else, but I did manage to write one letter to Anna. November 3. We have again resumed our old duties of camp life, and things move on once more in their wonted order. Nothing of interest transpires to make a journal interesting. November 4. Today we have had two reviews, one brigade review before General Burbridge and a grand review before General A.J. Smith. I begin to think these reviews are the most nonsensical operations that an army can be engaged in. They are all parade and pomp. Well, that concludes CFMC number one. Now we have a comment from, the, uh, from some family members. The first is from... Uh, Helen Zook Lacey, his uh, granddaughter of Tom Zook, quote, If only we had all of his diaries. I believe he kept one each year of the war. Now we can learn about so much of his fine personality, which, we would, which would be lost now, for none of us ever knew him. I've always been so interested in him since a little girl, and I feel I really knew him. As a little girl marching in parades, I always put flowers on Grandfather Zook's grave. I now have already my marker placed beside him and intend to be buried beside him. I'm sure our love of art and nature came from him as well as our talent. Helen Zook Lacey, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. The next letter is from John Ray, my father. Quote, In spite of the rough surroundings he lived in while a soldier, he was still able to see beauty in nature and did not lose his abiding faith in God. His great affection for his wife and children made the separation from them very painful. John S. Ray, Rocky River, Ohio. Now here's, there's a letter here from, from Alice Garcia Ni Ray in Quezon City, Metro Manila, Philippines. 
Things that I really enjoyed and liked most were the diaries of your great-great-grandparents and your dad. I'll have them book-bound by tomorrow or on Monday and include them in my collections of diaries of great people all over the world. Alicia G. Garcia, Ni Ray, Quezon City, Philippines. Now to continue with Tom Zook's diary. November 4th, 1862. We have had two reviews and brigade review before General Burbridge and a grand review before General A.J. Smith. I begin to think these reviews are the most nonsensical operations that an army can be engaged in. They are all parade and pomp and do no good. While going to the grand review, we passed through the town of Nichol- Nicholasville. It is a town about the size of Marysville, Ohio, and is the county seat of Jessamine County. November 5th. As other days have passed, so went today. Nothing of interest has happened. November 6th. As yesterday, so has today passed with but the usual routine of camp duties. Our major drilled us on battalion drill today. The lieutenant colonel, Laving, has been summoned to attend on the trial of a man in our brigade for murder. November 7th. Today has been so cold that we have had no drill, and the boys have made good use of the time by fixing up their furnaces and tents so that they will be comfortable to stay in when cold weather compels us to stay within doors. November 8th. This morning, the boys have been putting in all the spare time they have between drill hours, cleaning up their guns and accoutrements preparatory to going on review that comes off before General Smith at 2 o'clock p.m. today. 6 o'clock, the review has passed off nicely, but what the idea is of having three reviews in one week puzzles me. The rumor has been swiftly circulated in camp today that Congress is in extra session from the from the fact that foreign powers are threatening interference. The boys begin to think that the war has either just just commenced in good earnest or else we'll, we will soon be sent home. November 9th. Sunday again breaks in upon the world with, with its rest to the soldiers, as well as the citizens, for today we have no drill. Our chaplain delivered us an excellent sermon today, after which I spent the rest of the, of the day in letter writing. November 10th. Today the new order was generated in response to drill hours, and the boy pitched into it with energy, but at night found themselves, as usual, tired enough to be satisfied with their rough beds and lowly fare. Just after getting into a refreshing sleep, the captain came to our tent door and informed us that we should prepare for to move by 6 o'clock in the morning. Where the move is to be made or what for, none of us as yet knows and all kinds of surmises are being made by the boys generally. November 11th. According to order, we are on the move westward from Nicholasville this morning. The way they put us through was slow. General Smith and General Burbridge both attended us on the march at about half past two o'clock. We halted within a mile and a half of a little place by the name of Versailles, having marched a distance of about 15 miles. We passed one single village on the way by the name of Keene. November 12th. This morning we are once more on the move, and it is said that we will have to reach Frankfurt by night. The roads are excellent and traveling consequently rapid. At about 3 o'clock we reached Frankfurt, and I never was more agreeably surprised than I was when surrounding the bluff on the east of the city. We were anxious by looking for the city, but no city was to be seen and I began to think that Frankfurt must be a hidden city, when all of a sudden our eyes were greeted with a sight often, not often seen, far from the abrupt termination of the hill that we were gradually ascending, lay spread out like a map that looked that long looked for a city. Frankfurt is picturesquely situated in a flat that is surrounded on all sides by bluffs and hills of considerable size. In fact, I, I think it is the most beautifully situated place that I ever saw. We encamped just south of the city on the bank of the Kentucky River in what was originally a cornfield, but we had to make the best of it, for a soldier's bed is not always what he would naturally desire. Today we have made 16 long Kentucky miles. November 13th. 
Today we are up and off by daylight. We passed out of Frankfurt on the southwest side and gradually ascended the hill by the pike that winds round the, the hill until the hill entirely intervenes between us and the city. We passed through three villages today. The first was Bridgeport, about five miles from Frankfurt, and the next was Hardisville, and then came Clayville. The whole march was 29 miles when we encamped within 33 miles of Louisville. After arriving in camp, the boys had a gay time catching rabbits in this part of the country. The field in which we encamp appears to be alive with them. I suppose the boys must have catched with their hands alone about 15 or 20. November 14th. Off again just three miles from our last night's camp, we passed the town of Shelbyville, the county seat of Shelby County. It is a thriving town and contains two colleges, one female and one male. This town is 30 miles from Louisville and 23 miles from Frankfurt. This afternoon we passed another town by the name of Simpsonville and about 3 o'clock encamped on, on a stream within 15 miles of Louisville called Floyd's Fork. We made in all today about 17 miles. November 15th. Once more on the go, but today we intend to make Louisville. About two miles from our last night's camp, we passed a village by the name of Middletown. After getting under headway, the regiment that was in the lead, the 83rd Ohio, who by no means are our friends, took it into their heads to run us down, but got badly picked up in the operation, for we put them through on double quick for eight or ten miles. We arrived in Louisville about twelve o'clock and marched through the principal part of the city and then down to the flats on the west of the city and about a quarter of a mile from the Ohio River. Yes, the Ohio River. Once more we have got where we can get at least a glance into the free state of Indiana. November 16th. Sunday has passed as Sundays usually do in camp. We had a good sermon from the chaplain and no duties to perform on account of the fatiguing march that we had on Saturday. November 17th. Last night we had a young man die in our regiment. He belonged to Company E and was raised just north of Marion and was a nephew of Mr. Russell. This death was very sudden and sent a melancholy thrill of sorrow through the hearts of the members of the regiment. There was a death in each of the other regiments that are encamped by the side of ours the 83rd Ohio, and 23rd Wisconsin, and equally as sudden. It is supposed that we are all, that it is, it is supposed that they were all caused by our marching and exposure, but so it is, and probably will continue so. The dead march and muffled drum will continue to send a thrill of terror to the heart of the soldier. November 18th. Today we have drawn the rest of our outfit which remainder was in dress coat, shoes, drawers, and cap cover. There has been boatloads of soldiers passing down the canal close to our camp all this afternoon. The only regiment that I learned the name of was the 16th Ohio. They were all bound from Memphis, Tennessee. I was down to see the boats pass through the locks of the boat canal. This canal and locks is a high piece of work and must have cost an enormous amount of labor and treasure but they are now undergoing quite an alteration as the canal is considered altogether too narrow and they are endeavoring to enlarge it and alter its course as fast as possible. The 83rd Ohio and 23rd Wisconsin were ordered to be ready to move off down the river at 3 o'clock today, but as they have made no preparation up to this time, 3 o'clock p.m., the order must have been countermanded. What they are going to do with us I cannot yet conceive. It has been very wet and rainy since Sunday night, the 16th, and tonight it looks as if it would be rainy all night. The bottom we are encamped in has become a perfect mud hole. It is so muddy we can hardly get around. It can't help but be very unhealthy. November 19. This morning the camp is flooded. Some of the tents have to be ditched right through the center so that the men will not have to actually wallow in the mire. Some of the boys have been detailed to clean up the extra guns that are in the captain's hands, and all of our arms have to be out in order for we expect to be supplied with new arms and return the old ones. It is reported in the, in the company this morning that Captain Dwyer has resigned his commission as captain of Company D, 
and I suppose it is so, but it will be with great regret that the company will part with him. I have learned since writing the above that the captain's res resignation has not yet, and perhaps will be accepted. Some more of the company officers of the 96th are trying to resign. The reason I cannot explain. Perhaps it is on account of an anticipated battle at Memphis or somewhere down below. November 20th. This morning the order is to cook our three days rations, drawn yesterday the 19th, and have ten days rations put on board the boats so that we can move as soon as possible. At 5 o'clock p.m. we are on our way to the boat. The regiment will occupy two boats, the Lady Franklin and Ida May. At 6 o'clock p.m. we are on the boats where we will lay till about 12 o'clock tomorrow and then be off. The right wing, ours, are on the Ida May, and the left is on the Lady Franklin. We pass through Portland. On the opposite side of the river is the city of New Albany. Just above Portland on the Kentucky side is the residence of the Kentucky Giant, where may be still seen the, the snoremost gun and walking stick said to belong to that worthy. November 21st. This morning at 9 o'clock we got underway and put off down the river. The sensations of a boat ride are quite new and novel to me. At 10 o'clock p.m. we pass the mouth of Salt Creek River, at which is situated a little town, the name of which I did not learn. This far the Indiana side has been very hilly, and the Kentucky side, on the other hand, is comparatively level. I thought that we had some pretty large hills about Cincinnati, but these Indiana hills overtake them considerably. The river banks as far as we have run today are precipitous and rocky in some places. The banks appear to form a solid stone front for a great many feet in height. At 8 o'clock p.m. we tied up at a wood landing on the Indiana side, having run about 75 miles. All I regret is that I was on guard duty to guard today and had but a poor chance to journalize the incidents of the trip so far. The Lady Franklin came with us just after we had put up in last night. She had an er earlier start than we had, but stuck on a sandbar just after starting. The Gray Eagle also came up with the Lady Franklin. November 22. This morning we did not start until about 9 o'clock on account of the fog that always rises in the morning. It makes it unsafe to run. After we started, we did not get over a quarter of a mile until the boat that carries the left wing of our regiment, the Lady F Franklin, got stuck on a bar and kept us fooling behind for a long while. We passed many villages on both sides of the river, but, I ha but as I have no map, I cannot learn the names of them. About three o'clock, we pulled up at Kendleton, or something like that, which took about a half hour longer. Perhaps. He, he might be talking about Candleton, Indiana. Once more underway, we did not stop until half past five o'clock when, when we tied up to the Indiana shore to cook rations. The river begins to grow much wider and better as we descend, and it begins to look now as if we were going to have a pretty good run of it after all. We stopped but two hours, top two hours when we once more started to catch up with the other boat before laying up for the night. At about 9 o'clock, we came up with the Lady Franklin, which had put up at a little town on the Kentucky side by the name of Owensboro. Here we will remain till daylight. Sunday, November 23rd. This morning we were off by daybreak, and the Lady Franklin followed close in our rear. At 10 o'clock, we rounded up to the landing at Evansville, Indiana, and stopped just long enough to purchase some daily papers. Evansville is quite a nice-looking place and appears to be a place of considerable importance. We passed three or four riverboats at Evansville. They were the first we have seen since we started from Louisville. Arthur Copeland got on our boat at Evansville for the purpose of seeing his old Marian friends. About a half after four o'clock, we passed the mouth of the Wabash and found that river full up to the banks. We now expect to have some better running. About 6 o'clock, we pulled up to the Illinois side and put in for the night. November 24. Today we are lying at the coal landing, and, we will, and when we will get off it is hard to tell, for there is coal to be hauled from the mines, some three or four miles by railroad, 
before we can make out our compliment. Just above us on the Illinois side is encamped the 87th Illinois Regiment, and it is also said there, that there is a rebel camp some four or five miles from the opposite bank. Just on the shore where we are tied up is a couple of rebel graves. They were paroled rebel prisoners on their way home, but died on the Gray Eagle, the boat that was taking them down, and were buried here. We left the coal banks at one o'clock and once more proceeded on our way down the river. We ran till about nine o'clock and then put in on the Kentucky side at a little place known as Smithland, just at the mouth of the Cumberland River. Here there was an alarm just after we had stopped, occasioned by the report that the pickets of the force stationed here, 1,000 cavalry, had been driven in, and six or eight of the enemy taken prisoners. Colonel Vance was called on to hold his regiment in readiness in case they were needed, but we did not have a call at this point. November 25th. This morning we got an early start, and after running an hour or two past the mouth of the Tennessee at Paducah, here it was that so many of our brave fellows went up the river to the siege of Fort Donelson, Fort Henry, and the Battle of Pittsburgh Landing. At about 3 o'clock we reached Cairo, Illinois. This is where the Ohio puts into the Mississippi. Cairo is a small place, but appears to do a great amount of business. After staying at Cairo for one hour or two, we put out into the old Mississippi and began to move off once more towards Memphis. We ran down the river about 20 miles and landed at one of the many islands that here occur in the Mississippi for the night. November 26th. This morning we got an early start again and run past island number 10 about breakfast time. After looking at this point for a few minutes, one, one cannot wonder that the Revs made such an effort to hold it, for a battery two or two on the island would command the river both way four miles. In the evening, about eight o'clock, we passed under the guns of Fort Wright, but it was dark, so we had but a poor chance to get much of an idea of the construction of the works. But judging from what we could see, I would call it a very form formidable work. November 27th. This morning we were up and cooking rations early. At 10 o'clock we were once more off and run lively until about 1 o'clock when we moved up to the Memphis landing and there had to lay until the boat was unloaded, which took till about 5 o'clock, and by the time we got to camp it was dark. But the weather down here is mild to what it is where, where we have been so long and the boys stand it much better to lay out. I hardly know what to think of the looks of this city yet, and will wait a day or two, perhaps. I may get a chance to look around. November 28th. Today we did not put up our tents in the forenoon, but waited till after dinner, when we moved a few hundred yards and got on better ground. The boys are not doing anything of, anything of any consequence but fixing up their quarters. November 29th. The regular routine of camp duties are once more inaugurated and things move off in their old accustomed style. We are kept in constant readiness for anything that may happen to turn up, be it the rebels or a backward movement. It looks very much like rain this evening. November 30th. Last night was a little cool. The days here are warm and the nights cool and frosty. Just such weather as we have in Ohio in May. Today we have been waiting all day for an order to come for our review by General Smith, but evening has come and no review. This evening we had a regular built summer thunderstorm and it still continues to rain like an avalanche up to the time of our going to bed. Our tent is partly flooded. We have a poor sight for a night's rest. Last evening there was two or three distinct shocks of earthquake felt in this. Some of the boys say they could notice the vibrations of the earth sensibly for a day or so. Before writing a description, perhaps I may get a better chance to see it. December 1st. Today we have been put through after the old style camp duties. Come and go in their regular order. It begins to look as if we were going to stay here some time. We have had a very pleasant day of it today. The weather is almost like our Ohio summer weather. December 2. Today is cloudy and cool. We have had a drizzling rain mingled with hail. 
It is just unpleasant enough to stop the drill for the forenoon. We have had two deaths in the regiment since we came here, of which I have just heard. One was a member of Company A and died yesterday and buried without the knowledge of the company. The other was Lieutenant Jarvis of Company G. He died today and will be sent off to Delaware, Ohio tomorrow. December 3rd. Today we have drilled in the forenoon, but the afternoon has been set apart to be kept in honor of the lieutenant of Company G. But some of the boys are making good their time by making furnaces and fireplaces in their tents. The weather today has been like summer to us who are used to a more frigid climb. December 4th. Drill, drill has been the order today, and we are becoming once more used to it. The battalion drill this afternoon was stopped by a sudden shower of rain. The day is becoming cold and unpleasant and gives promise of a hard night to us poor fellows who have to sleep on the ground. December 5th. This morning we had a snow about a half of an inch deep and it was a wet, heavy snow, but the genial rays of old Sol soon cleared the ground of the visitor so uncommon to this climb. December 6th. The snow of yesterday morning left the ground in such an unpleasant condition that the drill has been abandoned for the day. But Saturday afternoon is usually set apart for cleaning quarters and preparing for Sunday morning inspection. December 7th. Today is Sunday, and the day is as clear and warm as a June day in Ohio. It makes one feel good to wake in the morning to catch the first rosy smiles of a morning like this. But a soldier's life is not always the one in which we can enjoy the beauties of the climate. The first thing on the program was the inspection, and then came the drawing of rations, and then they had to be divided, and as I am again act, acting sergeant, Selick being sick, it takes till nearly noon to get them distributed to the mess. So by the time I run over and hear the closing of the chaplain's sermon, it is time for dinner. This afternoon I wrote a long letter to Anna. The day has been beautiful, almost like summer. December 8th. Today is warm and pleasant. I begin to think that the Tennessee winters are no winter at all. If we were at home, we would think this beautiful weather of any to any kind of outdoor work. December 9th. This day has been a counterpart to yesterday. I have been on the water squad and therefore free from drill. December 11th. This morning I went, went with Lieutenant Williams to the city and passed over the greater part of the town. Memphis is a city that has been some rather pretty place. The public buildings are some of the finest and a most approved modern style. Some of them are elegant specimens of architecture. Two buildings in particular I noticed that are really splendid specimens of art, and they were the Adams Block and the Jefferson Block. They stand side by side. They have a small park in the center of the city, in the center of which is a monument erected to the memory of Andrew Jackson and surmounted by a bust of the hero. On one, si on one side is one of the expressions of that hero, that has been partly obliterated by the rebels. It was these words, the Federal Union, it must and shall be preserved. I also went to see the fortifications on the river to the south of and west of the city. They are tremendous and are as much as two miles in length. The regiment inside the works are very comfortably quartered and appear to have made preparations for winter quarters. December 11th. This morning we once more drew five-day rations, and the crackers we had to return for some of them were so full of worms that the boy po boys positively refused to eat them. I and one of my mess went out to our picket station today to take provisions to some of our boys that are on picket guard. I find that the country round about here all looks, all looks alike. The buildings are thickly situated, and the country looks more like some fine park than any, anything else that I can compare it to. I never saw such residents anywhere in the north as those that are here placed upon every one or two, three, every one or three acres of ground. The, peace, the people must have been immensely rich. December 12th. Today bids fair to be one of the wet and rainy kind, but notwithstanding we are ordered to appear on Grand Review in town with our knapsacks, and everything else that we usually have to wear on. 
At one o'clock, we got into line and started for Memphis. And after arriving in the city and being dragged around the streets for an hour or so by our dolt of a colonel, we passed in review with the rest of our brigade and several others before General Hurlbunt and then started to camp, which we reached, mud and rain to the contrary notwithstanding, about dark, having been on the tramp for about four hours with all of our load of accoutrements on our persons. December 13. This morning I am once more corporal of the guard, and as the style continues, we will, we will have a pretty rough time of it when night comes, but I guess we can stand it pretty well in this kind of climate. This afternoon we were ordered to go on review once more, but the order was countermanded before the boys got started, and a very happy time the boys had over the good way in which the thing terminated. We have one grand bone to put up with, and that is an order which compels the guards to remain at number one, the headquarters of the guard, all the time. We scarcely have time to eat our meals. December 15th. This morning we were compelled to get up at three o'clock and put on our overcoats and sit in the center of the tent so as to keep from being soaked with the rain that drives and beats through our tent, making it almost as bad as it is out of doors. Nine o'clock a.m. We have been compelled to do without our breakfast this morning, for it rains so hard that we can't keep a fire going, so we have to be satisfied with hard crackers and water. We have just been ordered to be ready to move by the 18th, Thursday. We, we are to have four Sibley tents to the company or their equivalent and make our loads as light as we possibly can. We had another one of the members of the 96th Regiment buried this afternoon. He was a member of Company G and was detailed as Chief Butcher for the regiment. December 16th. Today the captain took a squad of the Mount Gilead men over to the fort to see a lot of the drafted men that came there a day or two ago who are from Morrow County. The drill has been suspended also to give the men a chance to fix up a little before proceeding down the river. We received the intelligence today that Burnsides had taken Fredericksburg and the boys feel considerably elated over the news. It is also reported in camp that intelligence, intelligence is received of the taking of Richmond, Virginia. I hope it may, be, it may prove true. December 17th. Today the regiment is ordered to appear on review in town again, and I am lucky enough to have made an exchange with Corporal Eager so that I will be on guard instead of having to pack my knapsack all over the Sesesh City. 6 o'clock p.m. The boys have returned and say that old Vance has made a consummate ass of himself as usual, and they feel pretty well bored over the proceedings. If we only had a man to lead us, this regiment would be just in town. December 18th. Last night the captains of the 96th petitioned the colonel to resign his position, and in consequence were all put under arrest, and this morning were all marched up to the colonel's quarters and after a while were released. What they accomplished we cannot yet tell. Today is the day that we are to be ready to move, but as yet no order to that effect has been received, to that effect, and the supposition is that it may be some days before such orders do come, for it is almost impossible to get transportation down the river. December 19th. Last evening the camp was alarmed by a volley of musketry, that came from the direction of our picket station. The long roll was beaten and the companies were formed in double quick on the company parade ground, but the firing proved to be from a funeral squad that were fi firing a salute over a dead comrade that had just been interred, so the, so the companies were sent to their quarters. At this call we had more men in line than we have had for some time, and there is no doubt but that the 96th will be up and coming where there is work to do. In the afternoon of today, Colonel Vance attended for the first time to drill us on battalion drill, and a pretty drill he made of it, for after blundering around for an hour and a half, he got us so completely mixed that he got mad at himself and mad at the regiment, and in consequence kept us out about an hour longer than the regular time. After he, had, after he had somewhat vented his anger on us, he turned in and made a very pretty attempt to soft soap the boys and then sent us to our quarters. December 20th. 
This morning, the regiment has been ordered to hold themselves in readiness to move sometime today. In consequence, there has been no drill. About two o'clock, the bugles sounded to strike tents, and down they came in short order. And about five o'clock, we got into line and moved off in direction of the river, where we landed about six o'clock. So here we are aboard the Hiawatha, bound for Vicksburg, as soon as circumstances will permit. December 21st. We lay at the landing today till half past one o'clock, when the whole fleet of boats, 17 in number, steamed down the river in company. We are also accompanied by some gunboats. I have not yet learned how many. Our boat has the 96th all on board besides the 17th Ohio Battery. This is a side wheel steamer and moves very gently, but is very heavily loaded having all, all the wagons, horses, and mules belonging to the regiment on board, besides all the six guns of the battery and all their horses and baggage. December 22. This morning we find the boat tied up on the Mississippi side at a little village by the name of Friars Point. All the rest of the fleet are lying along the bank close by one another. Some of the boys from some of the other states have landed and burning buildings in the town. I can't understand why our generals permit this useless destruction of property. It cannot possibly do anyone any good and certainly will do a great deal of damage. I feel considerably unwell this morning and will be obliged to report to the surgeon. At this point, we came up with another detachment of the army that were waiting to go in company with us. There is now upwards of 50 boats in the fleet. We passed Helena sometime last night so that I did not get a chance to see that place. December 23rd. Today we are on the move again, but very slowly. Nothing of importance has taken place up this time. We are landing on the Arkansas side. The gunboats that are with us are signaling for some danger ahead, but we cannot understand it. This is Gaston's or Gaines Landing, and here Company D will have to go on picket duty if we remain. December 24th. Immediately after writing my journal last night, we, Company D, went on picket. We proceeded about 400 or 500 yards from the landing where we left the reserve and then established outposts at suitable distances. We had hardly got settled when the boys from the boats began to fire the building at the landing, although against the order of the general. And this morning there is hardly a house to mark the spot where yesterday was the landing. We also took some prisoners here and some arms that they had tried to conceal. This evening we, al we landed at Malikin's Bundy. Here is to be the first point of operations for our br brigade. December 25th. This morning finds us up and preparing for a march into Louisiana for the purpose of destroying some railroad track and bridges, thereby cutting off the communication with Vicksburg from the west. December 27th. My journal for a day or two has been sadly neglected on account of our Christmas march, for instead of the distance being only 14 miles to be represented, it proved to be 26, and the whole march and return had to be made in about 36 hours. Besides, we destroyed about three miles of railroad track and burned several bridges besides an immense amount of cotton. This work took about a fifth of our time, but today we are once more on the boats and moving southward. We landed about 5 o'clock in a bayou about 12 miles from Vicksburg. The regiment immediately and brigade, of course, formed and put themselves in marching sheep, but were ordered back to the boats again. December 29. Last night at 9 o'clock, the brigade was ordered off again and immediately moved off in direction of the enemy's works, which are some 7 or 8 miles from the landing, and encamped almost within sight of them. I remained on the boat this time being sick with fever so that I was unable to travel. Today there has not been a great deal done in the way of driving the enemy, but we nevertheless have made ground. The object appears to be to form a junction with, 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 with General Grant and cut off communications with Jackson, Mississippi. This, I think, will be the aim for the present. December 29th. Today there has been considerable fighting done by the 6th Missouri who crossed the run that intervenes between us and the rebel earthworks. They were sharply engaged and paid the penalty in a heavy loss. Other regiments were engaged, but I have not yet learned who. 
it is supposed that our loss is some 1,000 or 1,500. Our regiment has not yet engaged and perhaps will not soon as the brigade is said to be the reserve. December 30th. This day has been more quiet than any since hostilities were commenced, but I guess it is on account of changes that are being made to better our position and plant a few siege guns. I have not heard of any collision taking place today. December 31st. Today as yesterday has been quiet as far as fighting is concerned, but both friend and foe are busily engaged in strengthening their positions. Whether General Grant is coming from the other direction or not, I cannot tell, but he is confidently expected soon to attempt to make a junction with our forces. I have been very unwell today, but have done my best to try and alleviate the suffering of those that are worse than myself. Our sick were all moved off the Hiawatha today onto the Duke of Argyle, where there is already the sick of the 77th Illinois. The Hiawatha is to be used as a hospital boat and has moved up closer to the scene of action, so as to be handy in case of emergency. The moving of the sick today killed a member of the 96th as soon as he got onto the new boat. This is the second death in our regiment since we came here. There are more that cannot stand it much longer. January 1st, 1863. This is New Year's Day, but a lonesome day it is for many of us poor fellows who are lying here in these Mississippi swamps and marshes inhaling the miasma and drinking the water that is odorous with poisonous fumes and rank with impurities that kill more certainly than the rebel bullet. But so it is, and we are soldiers. One word of resentment from us is met with bitter denunciations and dreaded threatenings. Last night I spent in the cabin of the Duke of Argyle, trying if possible by kind attention and good management to instill into the feeble frame of a dying comrade new hope for life, but I fear our efforts were in vain. It is only lengthening an existence that is already overburdened with suffering and misery of the direst form. The army has been doing nothing that I can learn, learn of, simply lying still and waiting the issue of circumstances. At four o'clock this afternoon, I got on board a government wagon and started for the field of battle where we arrived about 7 o'clock, having penetrated into one of the most forbidding-looking cypress swamps I ever expect to see. I found the boys in good spirits, but a great many of them are unfit for duty on account of diarrhea and almost every other ill that Fleck is heir to. I laid down on the leaves with the boys, and I just got comfortably to sleep when the order came to take our arms as quietly as possible and then move with all possible speed to the boats, and to the boats we accordingly went, leaving the Rebs to wonder on the morrow what has become of us. We got on the boat about 12 o'clock at night. So ended New Year's for us. Joseph DeVolt of our company died on board our, of our boat tonight of typhoid fever. Another boy from Company C died last night of the same disease. January 2nd. Today we laid at the landing until about 12 o'clock when we pulled out and put off for the mouth of the Yazoo, and I don't believe there ever was an army so willing to leave any place as ours was to leave the Cypress Swamps in front of Vicksburg, and will they might be glad for three quarters of the army are unfitted for duty by the diarrhea and fever. If we don't soon get well out of this country, half the army will die, and the other half be so demoralized that they cannot be controlled. About the middle of the afternoon it began to rain and has come down in torrents ever since. The boats put in at Milliken's Landing, and it is said that we are going to encamp here, but I hope not. January 3rd, 1863. Today as yesterday we have had almost continuous rain, and living on these boats is almost past endurance. Yet we would not better it if we were on shore, for the mud is so deep that we could not get around at all. No move has yet been made either to leave this place or stay. January 4th. This morning there is quite a change in the weather. Instead of lowering clouds and rain, we have sunshine and warmth. At about 2 o'clock today, we got underway and put off up the river, but before going, we run alongside of the gunboat Mound City, where us Marion boys had quite a little chat with her commander, Byron Wilson. 
Today I received a letter from Maria and Father and answered it immediately, but I expect I will get to Memphis as soon as my letter will. January 5th. Today we have been fooling and stopping along all day on account of the scarcity of wood. It took four hours to get wood enough to run one mile. I have felt unwell all day. I began to fear that this diarrhea will eventually run into typhoid fever. It seems that the doctors cannot control it at all. January 6th. This morning the boat tied up at a plantation on the Mississippi side belonging to one Mr. Sutton, and I managed to crawl up to the house and get a breakfast of cornbread, fresh butter, fresh veal steak, and splendid coffee, and rich cream to flavor with besides. I got some nice fresh buttermilk. It has done me more good than a pound of medicine. I feel a great deal better this afternoon and begin to hope that I may soon be able to say I am well. January 7th. Last night there was two more deaths on this boat. One was in Company G and one in Company H, both cases of typhoid fever. Last night every able-bodied man on board the boat had to turn out and carry wood. Even Colonel Vance pitched in and toted cottonwood like a fine fellow. We took on board about 100 cords of wood and it took till 12 o'clock at night to get it on the boat. Today we have been helping to tow a gunboat all day which has retarded our speed materially. It is now asserted that this fleet is to go up White River, but whether it is so or not is very hard to find out to a certainty. January 8th. This morning we are tied up opposite the mouth of the White River, with the rest of the fleet taking on board wood, of which it appears we can never get enough. My constant wish is that we may not have to go up the White River. All the worst cases of sickness on board the boat, it is said, are to be removed to another boat this afternoon and taken to the General Hospital at Memphis as soon as the boat can run up there. I was included in those that were to go from our company, but I don't think myself extremely bad. Nevertheless, I am totally unfit for duty. The cabin and berths on the boat are now crowded with the sick of the regiment, the officers suffering equally with the men. January 9th has come, and still we lay at the mouth of the White River. None of the sick have yet been removed, or can we, or can we tell when they will be. If something is not soon done, the 96th will be among the things that were. There was a boy just died while I am writing within ten feet of where I am sitting. He was a member of Company G and looks quite young, but so the boys go. I have another comment here from, uh, from my father, John S. Ray. Quote, Slow day-to-day -day chronicle of the army moving toward Vicksburg. Much bad weather, much rain and mud. Many deaths from sickness, many unnecessary drills. Such a big effort for the result. The author caught, caught up in the grimness of the situation. Well, that concludes today's uh, reading of uh, Tom Zook's U.S. Civil War Diary. Good luck to you in finding, uh, preserving, and typing up old letters, diaries, and interviewing family, elderly family members. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.